criminal prosecution for any person who fails to report suspected child neglect or elder abuse. Uh, is there also codes that um, that have that, that provide for an affirmative duty to report suspected abuse of sexual minorities? I think. The, the, in the former sense, you're talking about where there, there may be third-party contacts where you're coming either in treatment or in a confidential clergy kind of a situation. There are affirmative duties in the context of domestic violence or sexual assaults that may be occurring. I know of no affirmative duty that would be on a citizen or somebody else who may be aware in terms of if we want to identify as sexual minorities and any conduct. Now, obviously, nothing precludes a citizen from, and being a good citizen, to report whatever crime that they may witness, and we want people to be good citizens and, and to report that, uh, but there, I don't recall an affirmative duty in the context of somebody, if we're talking about in the context of park cruising or people who may be engaging in, in uh, soliciting prostitutes or so forth, not in the same sense as that first category I think that you're talking about. Right. So, so, so um do you think that there's support because of those codes upon any person, not just therapists and so forth, uh, your neighbors? Uh, again, they risk criminal prosecution for failing to report suspected neglect of these vulnerable populations like children and mm -hmm. the elderly. And given the consequences of the shame and the aggression that ensues, uh, would would, would you see a, a, a need for such an affirmative duty uh, to, to report suspected abuse of, uh, of sexual minorities? Okay, I may, I may, maybe I'm not understanding the, the gist of the question. Maybe here. someone else could rephrase yeah. it. Uh, I, Terry, did you maybe get a sense? I, I'm not sure that I do either. battering their child, is, we have an affirmative duty to report a, that. So if we see right. somebody harassing or bullying or oh, battering okay, I'm, I'm a sexual you. minority, I'm, do I'm we have you. a okay. duty to Wait, report that? I apologize. My, I, I was actually coming at it from a totally different perspective. Thank you for the clarity. Of course. Look, here's the thing. As a human being in our society, if somebody is being targeted for abuse, and I happen to witness it, we have, we have the op we can either be non-committal, non-involved, it doesn't involve me, and walk away. And I think as June said earlier, we have an obligation to maybe intervene. I think from, this is Sim Gill speaking here, I think as human agents in a civilized society, when harm is being inflicted on anyone, everybody has an equal responsibility to try to stop that harm and certainly report that harm to any other authority so action can be taken to curtail that harm. The issue of being silently observing one person inflicting harm on another is not an acceptable proposition for me. I think that's a moral obligation that we have to each other as human beings. Would you be, find it appropriate to embody that obligation in a law so that one who fails to report child abuse, especially a professional, now can themselves be subject to some kind of sanction, should this be true of general citizens? Should, would, should there be a requirement that people be good Samaritans in this area? You know, Professor Kerr, I know that there are some jurisdictions have what are called good Samaritan right. laws. And, uh, and the challenge really becomes, um, what I think in one way what we want to have as our moral worth as good beings to be able to have that responsibility I think the challenge becomes whether we can legislate that uh, behavior uh, or expectation, especially where if doing so may put you in a harm. So that becomes that dissonance. I have a legal obligation that says to me that I want to get myself involved, I have an obligation to involve, but if in the process of getting myself involved, what is the range of acceptable risk that I'm willing to put myself or my family at that point, that's, that's, that becomes that personal choice. So I, I worry about legislating that. What I would more, more likely prefer is to change our social uh, climate and our ethical climate and sense of responsibility to each other in such a fashion that we feel compelled as 
human agents to want to do that, and we object to the abuse when we see other people engage in that. Because I think social progress always trumps legal progress. Thanks for these wonderful presentations. I have um, some questions for June and for Carlos in particular. Um, June, I'd, I'd like to ask you about these distinctions between shame and guilt and between the perpetrator and the victim. Um, and uh, the question, because uh, the way you define shame, it's a bad thing. And so I, I sort of started thinking about, um, should we be shameless then? Should we all be shameless? And if not, is there anything that we should be ashamed of? So I just want to kind of in, invite you to, to think about those questions. And, and also, um, at one point you said, there is a segment of the population which are the perpetrators. And I wondered if you could say more about, can we describe, I guess demographically, what that segment is, or is it that at certain times people become perpetrators uh, and, and people become victims? And then for Carlos, um, a very provocative talk, and, and I, don't, I can't tell if this is a question that's relevant, but, so if it's not, forgive me. Um, but it just started to remind me where there's this use of loca um, in so many complicated ways. It reminded me of um, there's a kind of migration of what you could call homophobia um, into this new territory of the joke, the flirt, the denial um, as a way of constructing masculinity. Um, one straight man jokingly flirting with his straight friend. Um, gay men and straight men jokingly flirting with each other. Um, there's a, in uh, hip hop culture, there's a, you know, the nice pants, no homo, right? And a, the caveat of no homo to clarify the nature. That is a kind of, well, it's certainly a movement. It may even be a kind of progress. Um, and, uh, it, and I think your examples uh, show that it's not a homophobia, it's homophobia. So there's a multiplication of the different kinds of forms of, and I may be using the wrong word, but I just wanted to, see what your reaction was to that. Um, thanks for the comment. I, um, okay, so I come out of the HIV world. Um, I did a lot of applied public health research and I was, for a long time, I became kind of allergic to uh, readings of, of Latino gay and bisexual men as being um, more you know, homophobic or more in denial, more having all these um, outcome variables related to internalized homophobia that were higher than anyone else. And I was trying to walk away from those particular um, models. And I, I think what, what's interesting about the, um, the potential to disentangle um, the, the utterance, the homophobic utterance from the voice of authority, um, if you, if you if you go back to the allegorical scene of interpolation where the hey you it involves guilt, involves recognition, involves misrecognition, uh, but doesn't involve authority in the same way that it once, um, that it may have for, in, in the scene that Althusser lays out where the cop is the one that, that hails you. If the one who's hailing you is potentially a social equal, and that is arguable, right? Um, then there's the possibility for us to talk about um, the circulation of these figures um, in various and very different scenes of interaction where they mean very different things. So you have multiple homophobias. You don't have one homophobia. You have the effects of that no homo operating uh, in very complicated ways that can't be simply grasped um, with, with languages that are available to us that are, that are rather static. Um, that depend or rely on very um, contrived notions of who a perpetrator might be and who the victim might be. Um, part of what I, I'm trying to be sort of emphatic about is that it's, it's, a, it's never a foregone conclusion who the perpetrator and who the victim might be. In fact, when, um, and I didn't get to this in the, in the discussion, in the, in the talk, when Maximo talks about I didn't, I, I told them everything, I didn't say anything, He's actually shaming the guy by not responding to him. Um, and it's a situation that um, with, with the distribution of shame, if you will, of a particular interaction is not a foregone conclusion. Just because 
you, you think you can out me doesn't mean that I'm going to let you do or let that particular utterance have the effect that, um, that you think it's going to have. And particularly in family settings, this was something that these guys talked about a lot. Um, not really um, feeling that they were in the closet, but not ever really wanting to discuss it with their families. And when somebody tried, what they would do using humor would be to turn, turn the tables on the attacker and shame the attacker for not knowing or being dumb enough to utter out loud what everybody else should have known. So, but of course, when you're talking about a different scene, like two, uh, you know, uh, presumably heterosexual men sort of hurling these things at one another, you have a different set of dynamics. But I think that one of the things that this allows, uh, the disentanglement of authority, uh, the sort of fixed idea of authority uh, uh, and, and in the context, is for us to think about exactly where power is located and not sort of um, have a deterministic view of where that's going to be. You asked two really interesting questions. Um, the first one was whether um, shame is ever useful. And I think that um, on balance, shame is a more primitive emotion um, from an evolutionary perspective relative to guilt. And so it certainly served, um, I think, more useful functions in pre-verbal days, um, you know, many millennia back. Um, and in very hierarchically organized societies where uh, it's really important to be able to demonstrate submission in front of the dominant in order not to be aggressed against. Um, that can be a very useful thing to just show that submissive posture. And there's evidence that um, feelings of guilt, of shame, rather, um, actually result in some physiological changes, namely um, a spike in pro-inflammatory cytokines, which I think I got that word right, um, which actually in, um, sh in small, uh, quick doses cause people to do this kind of submissive posture just naturally. Um, but we live in a much more complex society now, and we have much more complex verbal abilities and um, social problem-solving skills. And so I think that on balance, guilt is uh, certainly the much more useful emotion. There are times, I think, very rarely in one's life where we do something just so horrible and against our uh, internal values that it may make sense for us to step back, feel shame, sit with it, and really do some serious soul searching. Um, it takes a pretty uh, strong person with a pretty strong ego to be able to, to tolerate that and to do the self-introspection uh, without all of these defensive maneuvers that are typically brought up by shame. And I would say that um, these events are rare and that people who are experiencing feelings of shame about the self as a horrible person or a defective person on a daily basis, um, this is not adaptive. It's not in proportion to um, whatever uh, uh, sins or, or failures that they've uh, uh, committed, and it's just um, generally does not lead to very positive outcomes, both interpersonally and intrapersonally. Um, the inter the, it's a very interesting question about um, perpetrators and victims, because uh, until I started doing work with offenders, you know, I had the usual view of we're all the victims and the perpetrators are out there in the big house and or should be out there, um, but having spent the last eight years interviewing maybe 700 felony offenders, um, it's clear that, uh, that many offenders are themselves victims and have had very, very complex um, backgrounds. And I think in the case of um, specifically GLBT uh, uh, issues that the high rate of um, domestic violence among couples probably reflects some of this um, internal shaming. And so one can be both victim and perpetrator at different points. Great. Do any of our other psychologists who have been on panels want to add to this, Don? Well, yeah, I, I like, I, I very much like hearing the, um, the perspective that your office is taking. It sounds too like you've got data to support the efficacy of that, that it's not just the moral or the right thing to do, but it's the effective thing to do as well. Given that, do you still get heat from, uh, from legislators, from, um, from other prosecutors around the state or the country, um, you know, uh, regarding that approach that they're arguing that it's, no, it should be more shameful, it, that, that this is not the right way to go about it? 
Thank you. Uh, well, that's, I, I, I have found that when it comes to dealing with politicians and policy makers, the great stabilizer is money. And uh, what I mean by that is that you can have two groups of people. I can have my progressives, liberals, who understand treating people in a fair and just manner is just the right thing to do. I can have, on the other side, people who may take a position saying we have laws to enforce, zero tolerance to execute upon, and we want certain objectives to be gained. So my approach to the both of them was this way, and it sort of seems to have worked out. I say we can start at different positions, and we don't know what the right answer is, but we could agree what the right answer might look like. So I had these two groups of people, and I said, well, the right answer would be, it would look like, if you would tell me if you agree, one, that it can't cost us any more than our current model is costing us, and everybody said yes. Two, it can't, it has to honor our public policy and law enforcement objectives, right? It can't compromise on that, and they said, yes, that's right. And three, it has to give us better measurable outcomes than our current model is yielding, and they said, yes, that's right. So I could take somebody who comes from a different political perspective on different sides, and they can agree upon that if it is financially more sound, with better outcomes, with other collateral consequences of being a more humane prospect, then there is no room to object to creating this model. And that's the approach that we've taken uh, with, these kind of uh, with these kind of different kinds of models. I, respect the concern that I understand why we may want to use shame. I know that it was so important for us early on to bring in a collaboration with the GLBT community as a part of a community effort here. Because it wasn't a question about identifying that public sex environment as a purely gay environment issue and identifying it as a tied to the orientation of that person. It was a behavior issue, that a gay couple with their child going into a public restroom would be just as offended by it as a heterosexual couple going into that restroom. So we tried to be very careful not to over-moralize what we were trying to prohibit. The challenge has been historically is that we allowed the infusion of this moral judgment to enter in as a visceral reaction when we try to execute on these public policy objectives. And I think we have a moral and ethical obligation as public institutions to keep the conversation contextually appropriate and not let overlaps dictate in a way that is counterproductive the objective that we're trying to achieve. The objective was stopping that behavior. We did that. The also, Therapeutically, in the criminal justice sense, in the sense we also are trying to impact in a meaningful way the lives of those people who find themselves in the criminal justice model. The, our hypothesis was, if you're trying to make an intervention in a meaningful way, you cannot achieve that if you're driven by a shame-driven and a humiliation-driven model that you would result from a respect model. And that's what we were trying to demonstrate. Sim, are there people who argue that, well, dignity is all well and good, but look what we're losing. We're losing the opportunity to deter other people from doing these kinds of acts. That as long as you keep it on the hush, on the hush and hush, um, people are not going to be deterred from, other people are not going to be deterred from publicly cruising. Moreover, uh, we need to reinforce the value of um, uh, the importance of not having public sex, maybe the value for some people of, what, of the wrong of homosexuality, and therefore we need a public shaming, right? The same thing, we once had flogging, yes. we once put people in stocks that served an important social function. Sure. Haven't we lost that? Well, I, I, I can see how that desire is there. So the question becomes we have to look at circumstances where that idea has been executed and to what results. So for example, in places where you have done this kind of stuff, where you've done this sort of public roundup, this humiliation that, that takes place, 
you have to talk about proportionality. The risk that you're imposing on the person is so severe, which has led to self-harm. You really increase that risk. The other thing is what you've done, what you can demonstrate, what you can show is, when you talk about public sex environments, they are geographically identified. It's a particular park. It's a particular area, okay? And if you bring those resources and you start to shame, you, what you're doing is you're symptomatically addressing that issue at that geographic location, and that's all you're doing. And the word gets out, people don't go there, and what happens is displacement. People move from that particular location and they go to another place because you're not addressing the complexity of why people are engaging in this, you're just symptomatically addressing the external manifestation of that. So when I talk to you about the data, you know, which, you know, and I'll tell you what was, which is absolutely amazing in, in terms of fascinating and sad from my perspective as a person looking at this, are individuals who self-report as being married. And then we go through this process of, because one of our processes is to really engage with them with the police report, what, what, what's going on, and, and have them process this, and who still, after, they go, they go yes, I was uh, in a public space, I was having sex with another man, but I'm heterosexual. And no, I agree, I was having sex with, you know. And, that, and this com what I mean by this is, for me, it's like compartmentalizing your existence in a very, very interesting way. It, it, that, that somebody who is so deeply closeted, somebody who is so deeply shamed by their, by their own self-description, that they cannot even confess to themselves the reality of what they are experiencing. And, and what kind of an environment have we created where I have men who have lived the facade of being married for 40 years and a duality of existence and they're constantly fighting that. So, you know, those are the kind of things that I think we had to look at. Look, it's not a question of whether one lifestyle is better than another, it's about saying that all of us as human agents have a right to an authentic lifestyle. And if I am creating the environment by which your authentic self cannot come into being, as long as it doesn't violate the rights of anybody else, then institutionally I don't want to participate in that. And I just want to add that there is um, there's no systematic research and um, very little uh, uh, anecdotal evidence that these kinds of shaming sentences, which have been used um, really quite broadly in the 1990s, um, really have any kind of deterrent effect. Um, the fact of the matter is that most people who engage in criminal activities that get them in trouble are not thinking things through things very, very carefully. There's, That's you know, right. impulse control issues and like that. And the other thing is I think there's good reason to believe that we're not very good at affectively forecasting about shameful feelings because of all of the defensiveness and denial about that emotion in and of itself. I think we're much better about affectively forecasting um, when we might feel guilt. Um, but this, this public shaming and humiliation uh, certainly doesn't lead to rehabilitation on the part of the perpetrator or the offender, and there's no evidence that it also um, serves the, uh, this deterrent function. Other questions? Catherine? Tom? Sorry. I want to understand. Yeah. Um, it's interesting, and this is one of the real uh, benefits of being a sitting at the same table with someone um, with um, a very different perspective on these things. Because I've been thinking about what would be a sex positive way to, um, to actually think about some of these questions. Because I, while I agree with the point of view that, um, that, sh that shaming people is inappropriate, um, it really is um, a way um, to um, further perpetrate a certain kind of mar marginalization that they may be experiencing, um, how we imagine a psychological profile of denial, hiding, and um, self-delusion um, seems to me uh, very consistent with a lot of the, the kind of um, discourse um, that I've heard in this conference um, about, um, you know, what, what might be, I mean, like, what does rehabilitation look like? What if, what if, what if my expression of my sexuality is going to a park and, and finding the nearest glory hole. And it, are there ways to think about some of these things without projecting 
narratives of stigma, um, narratives of self-delusion, narratives of all the, to the to the people who are engaging in these acts. So that while you know we give people the space to ask for help when they think that they need help, but we also give space to those who are pursuing these acts uh, for reasons that have very little to do with stigma. The stigma being imposed here being, I was caught, um, and this is this just happens to be something that's against the law. Right. Now, and I'm, if I may, uh, just uh, I, I think that I think that's very. Uh, I agree, uh, and that's why I think uh, it's always um, as. A, as objective as we may want to be, each one of us inserts, again, our, uh, things into conversations. There's always a challenge, and I take your point uh, wholeheartedly. Uh, the challenge for us, uh, even in the most broadest sense, is I don't want to question the internal motivations of a per person's particular desire to engage in a particular practice. conduct or practice or whatever, because that should not be even something that I should be thinking about as a, as a person, as a prosecutor. And so my uh, issue is saying that in a, in a form of a participatory democracy, we have certain laws, and the question is the, what is the application of that laws, and within that, I reduce it to a behavior, uh, uh, and that's it, and any kind of other moralization that's being inserted into it is inappropriate for us to, to look at. And, you know, look, uh, there are, people have engaged in public sex acts since the, you know, the, the beginning of time. It's just the question isn't that you, the engaging in a public sex act per se is wrong. The question is whether it is, as witness, violates the, uh, the interest of other people. People go camping all the time and have sex up in the mountains all the time. That doesn't make it a crime until somebody actually, it, it's the other that comes into that equation. When the other's boundary and horizon comes out, that's where our civil laws or is, you know, and criminal laws sort of infuse there. So. I was wondering if I could ask a question. Of course, you, can. Uh, uh, you know, I was very curious, uh, uh, Carlos, that a statement that you made uh, that law as a context of trust between friends and the creating of a place of trust, like a spatial reality, right. and it sort of it got me thinking about something, saying that linguistically we're creating a psychological. If I'm understanding, maybe you can uh, elaborate. Does that mean that linguistically we're creating a psychological spa a space or safe trust space where there is no physical space readily available to gay individuals? Right. So I may physically occupy this space, I'm, I'm, I'm here, but I don't have an emotional space which is mine as well as I occupy this physical space. And by an act of linguistic utterance, I am creating a psychological and emotional space of freedom where, in the physical sense, it has been denied to me in my uh, practicing reality here. Is that sort of, in a way? Yeah, well, I, I'm a little too much of a Marxist to read it, to, to, to think of it as psychological space. But the, the, what I would say is the utterance materializes um, a connection um, that is tenuous. And it may, and, it, and it, it, it's, it's sort of spatial and temporally and interactionally specific. What that means is that if any one of those three variables um, doesn't kind of work, then it may misfire. When you think about, um, it's not about whether you and I are friends. It's not that. It's not that truth of that friendship. It's where you and I are friends and under what circumstances. So um, I articulate. Um, a sense of connectivity and a sense of belonging with you, provided that the circumstances as such are, are such that we, can, uh, that we allow one another to express that connectivity. Because what happens in a lot of the cases, in a lot of the situations is people say, yeah, I, I, uh, this person did this to me and I totally like blew him off, or this person did this to me and I, and I, I was so hurt because I thought we were friends. There is a lot of um, sort of misreading of social situations or disagreement about reading of social situation that all only gets realized when people interact and they realize that, oh my God, you're really reading this situation very differently. So, you know, the guy probably thought, the, the guy he had seen and they had interacted before, that they were close friends. And so when he said, hey, look, I was just like, hi, you know, whatever. 
But then this other one is thinking, uh, excuse me, you don't know who this other person who's with me, what, what the relationship is, right? So you're not reading this correctly. And furthermore, I'm not even sure that you and I are as close as you think we are when you invoke that particular, that particular utterance. So it's, a, it's, it's linguistic, but it's a, it's a, it's a linguistic and, and sort of interactional um, sort of setting that produces and materializes um, a, a connectivity that is very tenuous. So spatially, it may not be realizable, in, you know, but, it, but it may be realizable when you get all these other things together. The gentleman in the back. Yes, thank you all for your time and wonderful presentations. This question is for Mr. Sam Gill. Um, you talked earlier about um, individuals as a person rather than object of prosecution. And I was wondering how much of that applies in real life cases. Uh, the reason I ask this is, let's say for somebody who rather committed ridiculous crime receives like a year to five just for smoking joint or stealing a pub soda or something, whereas somebody who steals like millions of dollars is being like rewarded for it. So can you explain? Um, okay, so did I understand the first part of your question? You were talking about proportionality? Yes. Is, right, okay. That's right. And, and okay. Um, you know, I, I think that uh, the, 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 the responsibility of public prosecutors is to seek out the justice is reflected in sometimes in proportionality because it's about finding that balance. So in the context of what I call sex crimes or, or moral crimes that we identified, my concern has been a disproportionality that is there because the damage that we are inflicting sometimes with the prosecution in the way that we do it in public humiliation or shame, it is disproportionate to the conduct uh, as I'm evaluating it. Uh, in the context of white collar crime, if somebody steals, there is. I think there's a sense of injustice because, for example, we just had somebody, um, there's, I think the sentence just came down today. We had two groups of people. One stole hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not, I think, a couple of million dollars, and that person was not sentenced to any jail time. But the secretary who was working for this person, I think you may have read that today, right? The secretary who was per working for this person was sentenced to a year in jail. And when we see that, our sense of injustice is invoked there. And so I think that proportionality is a very conscious effort for um, for moral blame if you're going to use the law to utilize it. And, and justice is, and, and whether I have credibility for my prosecution or not, is going to be really measured by that proportionality. And I think we sometimes overlook that. I, I don't know if that answers in the gist of what you're asking, but okay. Yes. Uh, thank you all for your presentations today. They were, uh, they were amazing. June, this question is specifically for you. Um, you spoke of the importance of GSAs and, and kind of reducing uh, the, the impacts of shame. And I would agree with you that the four to 5,000 annual suicides and the 110,000 annual self-inflicted injuries that our youth are, are, are committing each year uh, need to be reduced. But I'm wondering what your thoughts are on um, the ability to reduce that uh, in the institutional setting as far as when children enter uh, preschool, kindergarten, grade school, uh, that uh, transgender intersex individuals are not really even recognized or accommodated for and the impact of that in uh, what we're, we're talking about here as far as trust and creating a, a space where, where a child can, can come into an institutional setting and feel um, recognized. Right, I think so that goes to the education issue and um, but education for both uh, children from a fairly young age and also their parents and teachers and um, making sure that uh, people are aware of the many different ways in which we're diverse and to make um, a safe place for, for all individuals who are in these public institutions. I have to say, as a mother of three kids, um, I, I see real changes. I don't know if this is um, something that you see much in Utah, but in Virginia, the public schools from day one, uh, really across our county, have uh, very clear messages about community, responsibility, respect to one another, um, respect for diversity. It doesn't always play out in much the way that we would um, hope, um, but it's very different from 
the kind of experience that I had um, going through public schools where bullying was the norm and, against all different kinds of uh, individuals and uh, there was just uh, no, no discussion, no, no conversation about it at all. Teachers never intervened and I think that now what we need to do is really get teachers and parents and peers um, much more directly involved in um, not being the uh, silent bystander. That's the question for me. Um, so anyway, really interesting presentation. So this is somewhere for June and Carlos. I'm back with shamelessness um, and the interesting question about that. So Carlos, I mean, your project, I cannot wait to have it out between covers so I can have this book. So I'll get to in a moment sort of only context that I have so far that seems to approximate where you are, though I think it's different. But back to the question of shamelessness, it seems like partly what you're talking about are the sort of amazing creative uses of shame, right, by gay people, people of color, gay people of color, that in other words, as, you know, forced experts on shame, we are busy in our lives sort of transforming shame into the shameless, but the very material world, word itself, right, contains shame in the word, so you can't have any concept of shameless without sort of a history of shame. So I guess my question to you is how important is the sort of history, the sort of shame signified sticking to the signifier important for the way in which that signifier travels and mobilizes? And so the, the book that I'm thinking about so far that I would teach or think about in this context would be Randall Kennedy's book, Nigger, um, and the subtitle, the, the Strange Career of a Troublesome Word. Mm -hmm. And so it seemed to me, though, that these are different histories, obviously. And going back to your point about Althusser, RSA, ISA, I mean, Kennedy doesn't speak in those terms, but I wonder if that makes a difference between the N-word with lots of cases having gone to court. I mean, he spends a good bit of that book talking about all the court cases that stick to the N-word that make it different, give it a different history than many other sort of invectives about sexuality or race or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so how you just think about this work that you're doing against the context of that work, you know, which many of us are familiar with, but it seems to me you're taking us into some new space that is not that space and some other way of thinking about um, signifier mobility that maybe has not been touched on by Kennedy that's really exciting for us to think about. Is that what you oh, okay. I thought there was some, another question. <laughs> okay. So. Well, thank you. Um, there is um, the chapter that precedes um, the code switching, switching chapter, chapter deals with um, one of the things that I, that I argue throughout the book is that um, the production of the individual is a collective effort. Um, the production of subjectivity is, uh, or, or of positionality is a collective effort. Um, and I begin by saying that the, the closet is not the making of a person. It's the making of a group. We co-produce the, the closet. We co-produce closets all around us, um, which is what I what I talk about when I when when I use the concept of tacit subjects um, and to frame to begin to talk about um, things that that involve sexuality, but it may be involved other aspects of relationality in particular settings that cannot be uttered because if they are uttered, they threaten the very viability of that sociality that's being established. So in family settings, there's always an elephant in the middle of the room where there may be multiple. There may be a whole zoo in there. And there generally is. And yet, uh, one only, um, the, moment, the moment when they materialize and the, the, um, the particular um, moment that's most familiar to people in this audience, maybe the coming out, the act of coming out, um, that, that act of confrontation um, or, or the, the utterance that could potentially produce a confrontation um, is something that these men really kind of um, avoid. Um, but they don't avoid it because they're, they're um, somehow psychologically deficient, right, as, as the usual explanation that's out there um, sort of goes, but because there's a lot at stake that's much more than, it's more than sexuality, and we are more than anything that we can say about who we are. So to compare with um, the whole discussion of the N-word, which, uh, which is an interesting comparison, um, in the, um, the signifier of La Loca, the particular figuration that I'm talking about, is, um, I say, not, um, 
not an abject other that lends coherence, but an other that cohabitates the self. Um, and that's a very important distinction for these men because, um, and, and the argument that I make is specifically directed at Dominican culture. Uh, the figuration of masculinity as seamless um, surface, right? Seamless, unruptured surface. In fact, the words in Spanish for um, letting out a, you know, the, there's letting out a feather, but uh, in Dominican Spanish, when you, when you want to say, I let out a feather, you say, me partí. And to, to partirse is to break, right? So masculinity, the figuration of masculinity that I'm talking about is one um, that relies on a number of things. One of them is a seamless surface um, that's not just produced by you but co-produced by others because others have to acknowledge that there's that seamlessness and an utter absence of a sense of humor, right? Yeah. Like straight masculinity, serious masculinity does not have a sense of humor. Yeah. And this is not, this is not, um, so part of what I am arguing is applicable to the relations that so-called straight men have with one another. Right? Where joking is importantly about what relationship we supposedly have with one another and how exactly do we express that proximity and how that might threaten how we are perceived by other people as men. So um, la, what the, the important thing is to, for me to kind of um, establish a little bit of distance between how I think about La Loca or the figuration of the sissy um, from the way that people like Judith Butler think about it which is, is this sort of abject other that lends coherence to the self. I'm saying that the abject other is always inserted in the self, that what, what, um, what can be potentially exposed when the figure of La Loca appears is a femininity that many of these men actually imagine as intrinsic to who they are. So La Loca doesn't actually express an external other that I need to reject, but it expresses the most natural other that's within me. Um, and so that's why relying on, on little like figurations, the, the, the idea of la loca, the using of the la to address one another, the feminizing of the names, is an expression of intimacy because it's an expression of that which many of these men associate most closely to who they think they are. Um, and this is something that they've learned as children, right? And so the, the, the intervention uh, at when I talk about the childhood memories in the chapter that precedes this one, is um, talking about um, you know moving away from the scene, a, a couple of scenes that are very famous in a lot of this critical literature about subject formation. The Fanonian scene that some people may be familiar with, uh, with where the white child points to the to a person and says, there's a Negro there, look, a Negro, I am, I am afraid. And that becomes the moment when Fanon talks about his, um, his um, very figuration of himself as a black man being embedded in and through or being figured in and through the eyes of the white child that's uh, fearful of that blackness. Um, so I say one of the things that I argue here is that when these guys face themselves in front of the mirror and they realize that they're so gender um, non-conforming, right? In whichever way they, they understand or they capture that, they don't realize it um, just with a, with a sense of, of shame, but they also, it, that, that shame or that moment of recognition becomes a condition of possibility for a project of regulation and control that's a collective project. So who becomes my biggest coach on how to be a man? My mother because dads are too busy doing something else that doesn't have to do with rearing children. So a lot of them talk about their mothers being their coaches in how to traverse the world in ways that produce this seamless, serious surface that is masculinity, right? And the, the, the reason it's very different from the trajectory of, the, uh, of a performative like the N-word um, is precisely because um, well, you know, the legal, there, there's no legal, there, there's no way to understand this in and through sort of this legal history or genealogy. Um, but also because um, La Loca is uh, an interarticulation of both racial and class difference. La Loca is not just any homosexual and any flamboyant homosexual. It's a scandalously flamboyant homosexual. It's a, it's a figuration of femininity that in the Dominican context is generally associated with lower class, dark-skinned women. So it's, it's already 
a figure that contains these elements of excess that are that are gendered excess, but also racialized and classed excess. So that those are different. Those are different. And it, and of course, it can erupt any minute because just about any. In fact, any man, any man, and this is very sort of um, a, a common understanding in Dominican culture that you know uh, to break oneself is something that can happen to any man. And so every man has to be vigilant of the very surface of the masculinity that they're constantly producing and reproducing. That's great. Yes, Lisa. I just want to uh, add a comment to, to this conversation, and that is, you know, one of the, your work is reminding me of um, uh, a lot of Jose Caroca's book, Tropics of Desire. Yeah. yeah you know, I mean, because the, by the, the argument of that book is um, the, the productivity of not being out, right? right? As opposed to seeing outness as always the progressive thing and not being out as always the shamed thing and instead seeing that there's a whole world of ways of, of not being out that are communicative, right? right? Which is what you're talking about. But the thing that I was really taken with is the difference between you know, his sort of literary method and your ethnographic one. Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, because you're, you're talking about the same thing, but the implications are really quite, I mean, you're talking about something related, not the same thing. Um, but the, the implications of the ethnographic method sort of a, allow a, a kind of description um, uh, that is, you know, a, you're, you're limited to the genre sort of formats when you're doing a literary reading. Um, and I was just wondering, in, in terms of this project, you know, I'm very delighted to say that Carlos is one of our graduate students from American Studies at NYU, yeah, you know, but um, I, yeah, I'm delighted to say that. Um, but I, I was wondering, as this project has developed, um, what the combination of methods are that mm -hmm. you're using to, yeah. 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 Um, the, the project began as an ethnographic um, research project, and um, it, I, I, as I, uh, so I, I conducted 25 retrospective life history interviews with these men in New York City. Um, and men who had self-identified as gay or bisexual who had migrated to New York after age 15, um, and, um, and many of them were connected to networks of which I was a part. So they were either knew, I either knew them or I knew people who knew them. Um, and the thing, the, the thing that's interesting about this is that I, uh, or about how I evolved with this, was that the process of um, moving from dissertation to book became um, a process about thinking more uh, clearly about the interview exchange as itself a kind of genre of investigation. Like we tend to think that interviews give a, tell us something about the reality of people's lives and we don't really think often enough about what people's different motivations may be to say certain things during interview ex exchanges. So a lot of the, the writing um, of the book became about un trying to unpack both what they were saying, but what they were trying to do by saying certain things. And um, because con the, uh, there was this constant um, exercise that many of them were affecting of actually underlining the very conditions for the production of the work that I was producing. So they would say things like, yeah, and so you, you know, I see that you, you're advancing because you're doing this for yourself and, you know, and they would, they would sort of give me the whole scaffolding of power uh, that was being enacted in the relationship. And I thought, well, you know, most social sciences, so, social scientists tend to simply just sort of take the quote and talk about, talk about it in relationship to this larger argument. But how about thinking about the, the very practice of gathering this material and my implication of it, because they were saying it to me all the time. They would, you know, and there were, there were moments when they would come up, this one guy came up with a whole taxonomy of the different gay guy, the gay types in the Dominican gay community, and he inserted me right in one. And I actually, and he said, and you know, he would say, first there's the drag queens, they, they think they were women, or they, what, they imagine that they were women sometimes, but they're not real women. Then, and then there are the, the, the little sissy boys, right, that, that are going around, you know, flailing, whatever. And then there are the people like you. <laughs> and, you know, because you, you don't, you're, you're gay, but you're like, you have a career, you have a partner. And he starts, like, spelling out all of these things about me that he assumed. He didn't necessarily know this, that I had a career, that I had, that I had uh, uh, you know, that I had a partner. That I, but these kids, when he talked about the kids or the drag queens, he would say, well, you know, and I don't see them trying to learn English or um, trying to, you know, get degrees or do things for themselves. But 
Whereas you, see, you're doing this and you're doing this for you, blah, blah, blah. And of course, he's um, a self-identified, you know, a, a straight identified kind of masculine, um, dark-skinned guy. And he says, yeah, and you know, for me, I would be like the butcher one, but in the end, I'm like a fag like the rest of us, blah, blah, blah. But it's it, very interesting how it, in the process of, of thinking about what they were saying, not just for its content, but for what they were trying to do with that content by, by throwing certain things out there instead of others, I realized that the interview became an opportunity uh, for a collaborative project of self-making itself. So the, so the method is um, very social scientific, while at the same time it's very deeply inflected by my training as a cultural critic. So it doesn't look like social science, though I would claim that it is. Um, and cultural critics see it as more social science-y than it actually is, because I, I keep on saying, you know, I want to be able to talk to the people who read liter you know, literary texts and whatever, but from the very uh, material that I'm speaking, and that, that should be a viable conversation. So, and Quiroga is definitely um, a, an important sort of precedent to this, yeah. Why don't we have two more questions? Have questions in the room? Yes. Uh, two things, first of all, June, um, my wife is a clinician and she'd just kill to have a copy of your slides. Are those accessible in some way? Very good. <laughs> sure, and we also have a book coming out of um, written by clinicians about their um, use of shame and their own feelings of shame as clinicians, which has been fascinating. Thank you. Uh, and as a whole, brilliant, all of you. And I, again, on a very personal level, I wish I had something academic to, that might be stimulating, but to Sim, you mentioned uh, Jerry Bowie's name and uh, an exceptional clinician, and we had a discussion a couple of years ago about uh, homophobia. And I, I'd like to just say I'm a recovering homophobic. And <laughs> I appreciate these kind of dialogues and meetings. Um, they really do open up the mind. They really do. For those of us that have been living in a cultural box for many, many years, that box seems to have diminished the quality of life. And as these forums and discussions are held, it's like it's so embarrassing to say I didn't know there was that other world out there and it is a, an enriching uh, perspective. Um, and again, Carlos, on a personal basis, just hearing you describe the comment that the informant said was directed towards him, it's not been an awareness of my own personal life how shaming and victimizing my light-minded certainly unintended to hurt, shame, victimize. Uh, it just, again, reinforces and helps me understand those little comments can be so hurtful. Uh, thank you for just really constructing that whole thing. It's just brilliant. Thank you, thank you for this meeting. Anyone else? If not Kim? Let's have a, a round of applause for our wonderful <laughs> We thank you all. Okay, um, I'm Kim Kornick, and for those of you who are newly joining, I'm uh, Associate Director of the Tanner Center for Nonviolent Human Rights Advocacy. And I'm up here now because um, the director of the center is, um, was unfortunately not able to join us today due to illness. So I really wanted to take this opportunity to thank all of the organizers, the participants, the panelists, the audience, everyone has just been, you know, the, the participation has been so enthusiastic and I think we've all walked away with these, you know, hundreds of aha moments and insights and just a sense that we've really gained a lot. So um, I just wanted to repeat those thanks and also thank um, the staff of the, the Tanner Center, Alita Tu um, and Victoria Medina and um, I'll ask you to come, up, come to come up in a second. Catherine, actually, do you want to just sort of um, extend those yeah. right now? Yeah. I, mean, I can only say somebody involved in organizing this. Um, I have stayed away from conference organization because it is so darn hard. And um, going through the process, now I'm aware of watching you know, what you all have done in terms of supporting us, uh, getting us ready to put on a conference. I mean, you're the backbone of the entire affair. There's just no other way around it. And so how much I have learned about what to do in a conference, the things to think about it, all the different levels of detail, 
um, these kinds of conversations would be nowhere near as vibrant without the structure. We've talked about the importance of structure throughout this, you are the structure. So we have some gifts we'd like to present you with, Victoria and Alita, if you'd come forward. And just to thank you for the enormous support that you've given us. So it's difficult to say um, concluding remarks or essentially to say the end to what have been three amazing days. But I do want to uh, sort of try to wrap up and say that I think that the, the keynote lectures and the panels have really fit to a T so many of the aspirations um, and goals of the Tanner Center. Um, for one, they have been so thought provoking. And I mean that for, for the panelists. I've heard so many panelists who are you know, sort of these foremost foremost experts on their topic say, wow, I had never thought about this and is really expanding my perspective on, on what I work on. And I think it extends too to the students who, you know, have been in various ways, you know, either voluntarily or somehow compelled to attend <laughs> these sessions that I think we've all gained something. Um, the other thing is to return to the idea that this, this, this center was formed with, um, with the purpose of recognizing human rights and their violation. And I think so many of the talks have both from very personal perspectives to speaking from the perspective of clinicians to people who analyze, um, you know, in an academic framework, the harms that happen in t through homophobia and, and denial of identity and denial of self, harms to health, harms to psyche, harms to relationships that, um, that are really sort of serious human rights, uh, have serious human rights implications. And I think we've, we've also gotten some ideas about, about how do you take steps to resolve um, or improve upon those, um, those issues. And then I would say that finally, I think we've really started a great dialogue through individual conversations and through um, just the sort of keynoters and panelists reaching out to the audience. So I, I hope and I encourage everyone to walk away with you know, efforts to continue that dialogue. So I'll just sort of say on behalf of the Tanner Center and on behalf of the director, George Cheney, farewell and thank you everyone for your enthusiastic participation and for sharing your knowledge and your experiences for the last couple of days. So a uh, round of applause for all of us, I guess.